everyone, thank you so much for being a part of the Turning on the Lights Global Institute community. This is yours truly, Dr. Alana DeGrasa, president of Turning on the Lights Global. And guys, I am super excited because the profit coach, Ms. Susie Carter, is here to join us for an exclusive interview. We are so excited. And remember, we want to hear from you. So if you view this later, make sure you leave your comments because we have other things we're going to follow up with with the profit coach, Ms. Susie Carter. So I want to first say, goodness, Ms. Susie Carter has so much to share with us. Not only is she a profit coach, but she's really passionate about helping business owners find the fun and find the revenue in what they're doing. So Ms. Susie Carter, thank you for, for really being here today. We really appreciate it. It's my honor, my pleasure. Anything for you, that's my motto. I love working with you. I love your tribe and your community. They're so responsive and so engaging. So why would I not want to be here to pour into? That's my tribe, right? To pour into you and people who are taking radical action, which your tribe takes radical action. So I love what you're up to. I love what you're committed to. We're on the same global mission to change women's lives and support them in taking it to the next level. So... I'm honored Thank to be you so here. Much. So I know, Susie, could you tell us a little bit around, you know, your first beginnings? Because I know people see you as this mogul, as this successful woman, this woman who's helped companies go from 10K to 10 million. And they may not understand that you even had any formative experience. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like for you when you were growing up? Yeah, I come from a very large family. So there's Bobby Ronnie, Joni Shelley. No, Bobby Ronnie, Stevie Terry, Joni Shelley, Susie Kelly, Debbie. <laughs> there you go, segment them. Because I forget them. There's so many. Like, wait, oh I forgot to go. <laughs> wow. So there's nine of us. There's six girls, three boys. Uh, my dad was in the military. My mom loved babies, obviously. <laughs> they get to a certain age and let's have some more. And then after she couldn't have any more. She started being a foster mom because she just loved babies and loved, you know, pouring in children. So we grew up, you know, very humble and, you know, not the kind of, I'm going to say poor, like it wasn't even humble. And it, we weren't the kind of poor that we didn't know we were poor. We knew we were poor. Right? Everything was hand-me-downs, right? So your clothes were hand-me-downs. And by the time they got to me, there's two under me. So by the time they got to me, they were pretty tattered up, right? Wow. Oh my God. And we lived in 1,200 square feet. We had one bathroom, six girls with one bathroom. I go there now and I'm like, how did we do this? How, where did we sleep? You, you know, we had two bedrooms. My parents converted the garage into their bedroom. So it wasn't insulated. It was just, you know, they're like, we need space from all these kids. <laughs> wow. So in those moments, you know, how did you shift in your thinking between that experience to you know the woman you are today well i think you know desire and drive really can dictate what you want out of life you know i believe that your circumstance doesn't mean who you are it's just your circumstance and i knew early on i wanted something different i didn't necessarily know what that was i just you know i would watch soap operas which that's how i learned what love was which i don't recommend that <laughs> you know tv drama I was so drama. Wow. <laughs> and my sisters are so drama, right? We're all drama because we were watching soap operas. But I knew I just wanted something different. I wanted something different for myself. I wanted something different for my life. And, you know, we grew up where when you were 18, my dad said, look, get a husband or get a job, right? And you got to move out. So my little feisty self said, well, I'm 17. I'm almost 18. I'm just going to move out. <laughs> wow. So I had to learn early on how to take care of myself. What my dad did give me is he gave me, you know, this lesson that, Susie, you can do whatever you want. You just have to work hard, mm. right? So I really, there, there was no education plan. There was no college plan. We never discussed college. And the community I grew up in, the, we didn't have guidance counselors that discussed college. It was go get a job. Right. So in school, I took home ec classes, secretarial classes. That's what I thought, you know, I was supposed to be doing. Then you realize that you're, there's no money in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my vocation, then I went to cosmetology school because I, I moved and lived with my aunt for a while. And she said, you know, that's a talent that you have. Why don't you do that? I'm like, okay, why don't I do that? So it wasn't like, here's this great 
plan that I'm going to do. It was just, why don't you go do that? So, okay. And I was really good at that. And then I learned how to make money at it. And 15% of your financial success is based on your technical ability. The other 85% is the sales, the marketing, the operations, the finance, the strategy. And so I was, you know, I got married young because, you know, I'm a good, I'm, I'm a great student, right? Get a job, get married. Okay, I can do those two things. Right. But, right. <laughs> Dr. Lana, my husband, my husband had a checkbook, a muscles, <laughs> and a car. That seems like it should be a good husband. <laughs> right. Because again, it, my parents didn't tell me how to find a husband or what the attributes are to find a good husband. You just said, find a husband. I'm like, these look like the things a husband would be. <laughs> mm -hmm. not, not a good tactic, right? We all know that now. Now I'm a little more seasoned, trained my children differently, right? So I got married young, had kids young, and the reality of that marriage wasn't, you know, meant wow. to be. Right, there was a lot of, dra of drama because I learned how to be in love on soap operas. So we had lots of drama, <laughs> you know, and I grew up in a very abusive home as a child. And so that was love, right? If they're yelling at you, hitting you, that must be love. Mm. And so when I had kids, I realized I didn't want my kids to see this. And I didn't want my kids to experience that. I really got clear that, you know, I experienced that. And I don't ever want anyone to experience that. So I moved out when my children were 18 months and six months old. Now, you know, girl, if you're leaving when that baby's six months old, <laughs> you are miserable. <laughs> and I use humor to deflect. So it's not funny, but that's just how I cope. That's one of my coping me mechanisms is just, you know, try, try to look at the funny in it. And so being a single mom, I had to really figure out how to hustle and how to make money. So I had no child support. I had no alimony, right? That was not something that was negotiated or I knew even knew how to negotiate on my behalf. And so I've had to figure out how to make money and being a hairdresser, you're an entrepreneur. And so I just, I really started looking at my kids need shoes. They need their tuition for their preschool. You know, I need to hustle. And that's why I really fell in love with business is just wow. understanding, wow, how do I grow this business? How do I turn this vocation into a business? And so I became one of the top professionals in the industry, right? When I was a top 1% of the nation, top 10% of the world. And that was just by the dollars that I produced. And it really came from that hunger. That's a really great question. And the response that comes off up is make it non-negotiable and quitting is not an option. Like quitting wasn't an option for me. I didn't have a fallback career. I didn't have a husband that would take care of me. And I coach businesses all over the world. And the thing that I see with women is they have a back door. I didn't have a back door, right? So they either have another income from their husband or, you know, they've got a, a, a big safety net financially. So they don't have to be as serious, right? So take quitting off the table, like make it non-negotiable. Like I'm going to make this work no matter what, because I didn't have a choice. I had to make it work no matter what.